and even people who have just joined us to learn about what's happening and think about what we can do to solve this problem. You've supported us for 40 years, or maybe just a few weeks, but uh, put us in the position where we can be developing innovations and um, turning them into viable and sustainable solutions that can not just get us through this drought, but really transform our city to be healthy, safe, fun, and sustainable. So what we're gonna do this morning is um, give you a lot of background. It, this is an evolving situation where the drought conditions are changing daily. Uh, the impacts we're discovering are changing uh, daily. And so there's a lot of data. I'm gonna try to rush through it. Um, we've scheduled this for a half hour, and so our plan is to end it on time at 10.30. But I could run on for probably an hour and a half, so forgive me if I, um, if I rush through this part. So we're gonna look at evolving impacts and threats. Uh, note that this is a crisis, but in the crisis there is opportunity. Talk about what Tree People is doing, what you can do, and then get to your questions. So, uh, without further ado, Tree People is a first responder. You know, for 40 years we've developed and delivered solutions uh, that engage nature with trees, soil, water, with people and communities to make these solutions happen and then link what the people do back to government um, and engage them, not just as individual agencies, but brought them together as a whole. Our goal in this drought is to produce a coordinated response to rapidly, smartly, and effectively solve the region's short and long-term water crisis. So fix the emergency, um, get people what they need, but make the investment go for the long term of really rebooting Los Angeles to be that sustainable city. So the threats um, and impacts are very real. Background, this is a satellite NASA shot of California a year ago, last January. This was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, take a look. That's the snow that covered the Sierras, the White Mountains. That's California's water supply. We don't have enough reservoirs around the state. There's no way to have enough to store the amount of water we use. We store it in snow. For the last 100 years, that's what we've done. But climate scientists have been telling us for 20 years that we were going to be facing this. And here it is today. Um, it's pretty severe. Now they said that this is gonna be happening over the long term. The short term crisis, it's here, here now. Uh, we don't know whether it's gonna go away in the next weeks so that we get some great storms or whether it'll go away in a year, but it's important to understand that it could go on for many years. So we are in a crisis. We've just had the driest calendar year in recorded history. The governor had just two days ago said this is the worst drought in California's history. It's affecting farms, our ability to produce food, food for the state, but food for the country and actually much of the world is fed by California. We're the eighth largest economy on the planet, um, making us, yeah, the economy of the eighth largest country and um, there are significant implications. Uh, but beyond money, it's affecting wildlife, the ecosystem, uh, which is our life support system. We don't know when this drought will end. We don't know how long our water will last. We do know that we are in, as I said, both this short-term emergency and a long-term crisis. We are now facing what scientists have been telling us, which so many people have been in denial about uh, that we got a problem. But having the problem is, you know, the opportunity is that we are in a short-term emergency and in a long-term water shortage crisis. It's also important to know that even in the drought, even in this driest year in recorded history, last year, it still rained 3.6 inches in Los Angeles. And when that happens, well, every time it rains an inch, we throw away 3.8 billion gallons of water. 
we throw it away because we have put our uh, streets, roads, parking lots, homes, buildings on top of beautiful functioning watershed that used to capture that water and give us regularly uh, a water sufficient landscape. But by sealing the land, we literally created a desert. And so, by the way, that 3.8 billion gallons, the city of Los Angeles says it's 3.8 billion gallons per half inch, double this, but we're being really conservative in saying this number. Why? Because last year alone, on those numbers, we threw away 13 billion gallons of rainwater, or 3,400 gallons per person for the 4 million people in Los Angeles. We could have captured it, and we can still build a system now that does it for the next time it rains. And the action that we tell you about today, for anybody who attended our workshop teaching people how to do this two weeks ago, got their rain barrel, installed it, there was enough rain two days later to fill several of those rain, rain barrels, and you'd have that extra water on hand. Let me go back. So um, foundation of, of knowledge to move us forward. Los Angeles today, um, we use 123 gallons of water per person per day. That may sound like a lot, but it's actually very highly conserving. Other cities around this country are using in excess of 200 gallons per person per day and more. Los Angeles today, because of very good, very aggressive um, drought education program 30 years ago, when we had a million fewer people uh, we were able, when three people participated in this drought education program, the Metropolitan Water District led it. It was aggressive and it was great. Every weather forecaster in town was turned into a water educator. And, um, and they created a daily water use thermometer to show us how much water we were using and how much we needed to be saving. And because it was a consistent message across the media, we saw that the little things they asked us to do, like turning off the tap while brushing our teeth or shaving, capturing water in our sink, taking shorter showers, those all seem like they don't make a difference, but they really, really do because there's millions of us. And if you just put a pot of water in your sink uh, and watch how much water you lose while you're waiting for the hot water to come and while you're uh, rinsing your dishes or whatever, it's tens of gallons per time you do it, that water could be captured and used to save your plants. But anyhow, the little actions that we take add up to make a difference. This past campaign, the campaign of 30 years ago, worked that within weeks, we were able to cut our water use by 30%. And we locked in that behavior such that with a million more people in Los Angeles, we use less water than we did 30 years ago. So this number is a really, really good number. That the lowest rate of water use around Los Angeles was achieved by the city of Long Beach in the drought two years ago. Uh, they got their water use down to 100 gallons per person per day. Um, half the water that we use in the city of Los Angeles is for landscape irrigation, just watering, mostly watering lawns. Um, and in the region, 40 to 70% of the water we use is mostly for lawns. Um, very important to how we move forward is to understand that Australia, during their recent 12-year-long drought, they were able to um, drop their water use from in a city like Brisbane, 83 gallons per person per day to 33. And when the drought was over, they stayed there. It only returned to 40 gallons per person per day. So they, they radically changed their lifestyles and learned how well they could live on less water. It gives us a sense of what we can do. They did it with great education, providing incentives, financial incentives, penalties if people didn't comply, and they gave people rain tanks, cisterns, uh, highly discounted so they were affordable. They distributed millions and millions of them. And so cities like Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, 30% of the single family homes now have rain tanks. Uh, 
the city of Adelaide, who has the closest climate to Los Angeles, 45% of the single-family homes have these tanks. They also save their heritage trees, and we're going to get into that because that's critical for uh, public health in our cities today. Why we're looking at Australia is, first of all, they were the first to hit this major uh, long-term water crisis, just as the climate scientists said. Climate scientists said California was going to be the next big place to be experiencing severe long-term water shortage, but also their lifestyles are practically identical to ours. It's a really good match, except that we don't eat Vegemite. So what's happening now, right now in Los Angeles, is that trees, native trees like oaks, shemites, they're dying. They, uh, if you walk through the hills, go up to Topanga, drive along Mulholland Drive, you will see um, trees are turning brown and many have started to die. Trees in our parks are also um, starting to die. Uh, the Parks Department contacted us several weeks ago because they noticed um, extreme drought, drought stress and that they were starting to lose trees. The Parks Department has been working in partnership with us um, for years. We've been putting thousands of volunteers in parks to care for trees. And what happened is that they have, um, they had a, adopted very water conserving operations so they could cut way back in their water use. As a result, in the last three years of very little rainfall, it's put um, trees now in, in stress. So they've asked for help. This is a shot from Tree People's headquarters, the trails. You can see um, a shot of a dying eucalyptus. Um, not that that belonged there, but some of these trees have been here for almost 100 years. Just this week, um, we got terrible news. One of uh, our oak trees just around the bend from this shot that we had planted 20 years ago, last week it was alive, it was beautiful, it was thriving, it was healthy. This week, our staff found it brown, laying down on the ground. They did diagnostics to find out what happened, and um, it's shocking. The entire root system had been eaten by gophers. It looked like the tree had been cut down by beavers. The teeth marks, everything were there. There was no roots. The gophers don't have water. The wildlife don't have water, and so they're starting to eat everything. So I don't want to create panic, but this is when we're talking about the impact on the ecosystem. It's the critters. It's the birds. It's the pollinators. Um, we have deer now eating our, our um, beautiful landscape. Don't mind that they're doing it. They need the water. Um, but we haven't seen this happen. So the conditions are, um, are a little scary. Um, and as we know, uh, Trees aren't merely decorations. That's been one of my, my statements forever. Uh, we plant trees to help heal cities uh, and to restore the ecosystem services. As we lose them, uh, we lose our life support system. So what do tree, tree people have to do with water? Trees and forests really are our water supply system. They're our water catchers. You know, in England, Australia, Canada, um, they call the place that, uh, where water falls and gets put to the, down to the aquifer, they call it the catchment. In America, we call it a watershed. Uh, I think it, we might want to adopt this term of catch instead of shed. Um, but let's show you how that works. Here's uh, California's uh, state tree, a coast live oak. Um, this one uh, is a really good demonstration of how trees work. So here's an uh, animation of that same tree, a hundred feet canopy. So this is a very large one, a very old one, um, but it, it, it's a good example of how trees work. So what we tend not to appreciate is what we don't see, what's underground, the roots. And the soil was built from this tree over hundreds of years of leaves falling, um, and it became habitat for critters that dig and drill, big ones, snakes, rodents, hopefully not eating <laughs> the, the roots this time, um, small ones, worms, bugs, uh, microorganisms like fungi. They all work together as a community and create 
in essence, a tank and a sponge that captures water and holds it, and as you'll see, cleans it. But the canopy of the tree, the top also acts as a tank. The first tenth of an inch of rainfall that falls on, on a tree is held in the canopy. And then after that, uh, that amount of water uh, falls and is exceeded beyond a tenth of an inch, it drops down from the leaves into the ground, slowed down, and is captured in that area. Um, water that's flowing across the surface also flows into this tank. So we noticed this, but nobody mentioned this part of how the water cycle works when we learned it in elementary school. So I asked the U.S. Forest Service, what's the capacity of that space? Turns out they calculated in a tree this size, that tank, five feet deep, 100 feet across, filled with rocks, roots, soil, everything, it still holds 57,000 gallons in a 12-inch flash flood. It takes that water that came in polluted, the critters clean it, and they send it on down to the aquifer, recharging our water supply. Our problem is we've removed these sponges, we've removed these tanks, we've re removed this treatment system and replaced it with um, concrete and bureaucracy, different agencies that have to replace what the tree did integrated elegantly uh, without complaining. We've created flood control system, water supply system, soil conservation service, uh, sanitation service. All of these agencies who operated separately spend money uh, not integrated and um, make us very unsustainable. So we've seen these patterns. We saw it coming. Um, when we pave the city and throw away the water, uh, according to Mayor <clears throat> Eric Garcetti, we're throwing away 400 million gallons worth of water every year. Um, when we do that, then we have to bring all this water into Los Angeles at a cost of over an extra half billion dollars a year. It makes us unsustainable. It damages our economy and our environment because we're not investing that money locally. We're investing in an energy to pump the water here. So 20 years ago, we set out to show um, that LA could be a much healthier, more resilient city if we managed it as a watershed instead of as a drain. And we began doing research, uh, 10 years of it. And the results showed that it was actually feasible and affordable and we could actually make it happen, capturing the water and the money that we were throwing away. For the last 10 years, we've been working with agencies to collaborate, pilot, test these things. They've actually been adopting the practices, have been adopting integrated plans, and um, you're seeing projects happen all over town. But now's the time that we should jump in and take it to scale. So what's tree people doing about the drought? Um, we're helping save trees. We're scaling a major conservation campaign with media, social media, workshops to empower residents on how to hyper-conserve. We're facilitating agencies collaborating. Right now, we're beginning talking with them to unify messages, strategies, emergency responses. Uh, to, so hopefully, they can work together to bundle their resources to provide better incentives to encourage conservation. We want to see an investment now, not just to get through this, but invest the dollars right so we get through and build a new local water supply. And by working together, we believe the agencies can attract a lot stronger uh, package of help from the federal and state government. And in the long term, Tree People has been building and we're getting ready to launch a major campaign to adapt LA. So on the part of saving our trees, uh, here's an example of how our working from the top down with these agencies will fuse with working with the grassroots. When the Parks Department called us to tell us about the trees failing, I was able to immediately go to uh, LA's Bureau of Sanitation who operates our wastewater treatment plants. They agreed to give us recycled water. The Department of Water and Power who owns that water approved using it. The Regional Water Quality Control Board and the Department of Public Health immediately gave us permission to use this reclaimed water so we can get the water to the trees in the parks. What we're going to do is what the Australians did, which is deploy these temporary water uh, highway dividers 
into the areas where the trees are being lost. And what you see here is all these tanks. Whoops, let's go back. Um, this allows water to be delivered into these tanks, about 180 gallons per tank. They're connected to a drip irrigation system that uh, drips trees to the roots. The drip system's covered with mulch. We, um, thanks to a really generous donation from uh, Betty White, we've been able, and Cornelia Funke and some of our donors, we've been able to deploy this very, very quickly. And so we're getting our first tanks on Monday. We're going to do a pilot project at Tree People to work out the kinks and then hopefully raise enough money to start getting hundreds and then thousands of tanks uh, deployed across the city as city tells us where they're needed. But from the bottom up, we need to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to, to find the trees that are in stress in their neighborhoods, uh, even around their homes, through the generosity of a, a grant from the state of California, um, we have been building a, a tree mapping system that can put every single tree in Los Angeles, uh, if somebody adopts it and goes to it and marks it, we'll be able to create a, a living map of the LA forest. Well, everyone through, once people join that and mark trees, they can adopt them, say which ones they're adopting and caring for. We can feed them all kinds of information on what to do and then um, um, report what's happening. If they see trees that are stressed that uh, they can't adopt, we'll be able to send other resources to it through crowdsourcing. Um, so we're also launching the campaign to help people learn how to conserve and hyper-conserve. We, Today, we run workshops on rainwater harvesting, on turf removal, on use of native plants, on drip irrigation, on how to radically reduce your water use and still have a beautiful, beautiful landscape. Uh, when people come to our workshops, they get rain barrels for only $10 a piece because in our partnership with the Department of Water and Power, together we were able to go to Metropolitan Water District, get them to... Uh, just recently start a rain barrel rebate program. So instead of these costing $100 to $150 per uh, rain barrel, and they're only 55 gallons, but instead of that cost, you can get them for $10. Um, we've been helping installing Australia-style cisterns in schools. And here's an example of what I did in my own home with um, taking just sheet mulching, just me and Leslie there, my friend. In one weekend, we were able to go from this to laying out cardboard I, I got out of Costco's recycling bin, uh, laying out mulch, connecting up um, legal now, gray water from my washing machine with this three-way valve. That's all that the city requires you to do. Connecting that water to a, um, a pipe in the mulch and then uh, also connecting up uh, to get plants started, a uh, little drip irrigation system. This is three weeks after we planted these tiny flowers. This was several weeks later. My neighbors loved it. We loved it. And after the sunflowers, we had corn, we had squash. We were producing great food instead of using tons of water and, and lawn. We can do what Australia did by getting, um, by building a smart cistern network across Los Angeles. Um, it's possible. People everywhere adopted this. And you can see this is a typical Australian home, not a whole lot different than Los Angeles in the city. They were able to put several thousand gallon tank on their house. Um, they look like this in narrow spaces or they're round. Here is their equivalent of Home Depot. They had a rain tank um, center in every one of the stores and uh, even an online system to size your tank, get your rebate and all of that. We can easily do this here. But in Los Angeles, we can take it the next step. We have the chance to use 21st century infrastructure and upgrade our whole system. Imagine if these were outfitted with remote control switches so we could actually build a smart water grid. It would be the first in the world. We could do it. Um, I even, in trying to convince agencies 20 years ago, invented a fence that could hold water. Um, this unit uh, holds 400 gallons per panel, uh, can be lined up so you can hold five to 10,000 gallons per fence line uh, in homes across LA. We're actually talking to people at DWP and the, um, the Green Innovation Zone about manufacturing these or something like it locally. So um, 
we can take it to scale. Working with uh, the city groups like the Center for the Council for Watershed Health, we've shown that streets can be adapted to capture water. This is a glimpse of Elmer Avenue. You know, the city is getting just ready to spend at least four billion, and we just saw a new estimate at seven billion dollars to rebuild LA streets because they're failing. Imagine if their money was allowed to go and be matched with emergency water money, new water supply money to actually build a healthier, sustainable LA. We think it's possible. We've been doing this with schools. They're a great place that needs to be retrofitted. Here's a typical school in the valley. Um, putting a uh, rain water filtration system under it, a capture recharge system under it. This was the school before. This is it today. It's now part of the city's water supply, flood control, water quality system. This could go citywide. Um, here's some links to uh, sources for uh, gray water help, for rain barrels, uh, especially for our workshops. I'll come back to this. I just want to say, um, imagine us creating a smarter, water safe LA. Let's open it to some questions. I'll go, oh. So use the chat feature. Um, I, it's up, it's the round thing. I'm not sure if you see it here or if it's somewhere else on your screen, but uh, feel free to just click in this and say, say hello if you have a question. And we're going to, let's see. OK, our first question. Um, do you see that other counties in California besides LA are implementing your ideas? Um, yes, in fact, um, Orange County has been a really aggressive um, adopter and a world leader, really. They, the first thing they did uh, was start integrating their various water-related agencies and got their act together. So they got the first major state and federal money because of that, and they built an amazing water recycling system that, as I said, is a model for the world. It's been copied by Singapore, by other cities all, all over the world. Um, uh, the head of that agency, Celeste Cantu, is is fantastic advocate. Um, I didn't have time to show you our diagrams of how we facilitate bringing the agencies together, uh, but uh, they got that early. The state actually, uh, because we started this work 20 years ago, uh, state legislatures like um, Fran Tavley, when she saw the economics that we had delivered, just uh, wrote a small state law that, that floated under the radar and got passed, and it basically said the state should never spend any more money on water unless it comes through an integrated planning process. Well, that has revolutionized planning in the state, um, and, it's, and it's making changes, but most of them you're not yet seeing on the ground. So then, next question um, is, what are some conservation tips that I can employ with my kids in our apartment where we don't have control over things like cistern use? So uh, the first, first fast things you can do after breakfast today or after lunch or whenever you brush your teeth is actually um, make sure that when you wet your toothbrush or your shaver, just turn on the water for a second to wet it, brush your teeth, and then use it for a moment to, to rinse instead of what many people do is leave the water running. That uh, for just you know 30 seconds or a minute or two of leaving the water running, you lose many gallons. Same thing if you're doing uh, washing dishes. Either get a basin or fill your sink and um, run the water and uh, and and use it, and then change the water and just rinse with it. You can actually. Um, save a huge amount of water. Of course, taking a shorter shower. Tr um, try to keep your shower under five minutes. I'm sure we're going to see, as if 
the drought continues and things unfold, I'm sure the water agencies will start to, uh, distributing egg timers. Um, if and I'm answering those questions for you if you're living in an apartment and that I made an assumption that you don't have a landscape to water, but you might. So really important that even the dishwater and your shower water, all of that can be captured. The warm-up water is fresh, right? So if you put a bucket in your shower uh, or in your sink, you can capture all that water and take it out to the garden and water a thirsty tree. If you've connected up a gray water system, uh, then I will um, do a live demonstration um, another time. That, that gray water system I hooked up, I actually, uh, our washing machine dumps the water into an eight gallon uh, bucket outside and then it, it flows to the garden. Well, it's right outside my kitchen door, so I'm actually carrying several gallons every time I use our kitchen sink out to that same little barrel and I just dump the water in. So um, we'll be providing a lot more tips, and I'm sure you're going to be seeing a great campaign coming out from the state that Lady Gaga has volunteered to do. So stay, um, stay tuned. So the next question is, will tree people be posting oops, I just, uh, volunteer events to our website? for us to sign up and help water areas around the city this year. Yes, in fact, we will. Uh, we'll be, as we build this thing, we'll be, um, as I showed you, um, getting the tree map going, but we'll also be recruiting volunteers, training you, and deploying you, and all that is uh, to be coming very soon, so stay tuned. Um, another question is, we have lots of avocado trees in my community. Should some type of trees be removed in the drought? Uh, it's actually a really um, good triage question. Um, there, there are some that are going to die because we simply um, they are way too thirsty. I'm not going to say that the avocado. I mean, avocado is a very thirsty tree, um, but it is also uh, very, very uh, effective at helping save lives. So I want to um, jump into something that I skipped over quickly is why did Australia deploy to save those their large trees? Los Angeles has some tree canopy. Some of our neighborhoods we have as much as 25, 30 percent shade cover. But we have areas all over town, especially in our underserved communities in South Los Angeles, East Los Angeles, where there's under 5% tree cover. Those areas, because they are so much hotter, um, the stress, the sun, the heat adds to, um, to critical cumulative impact issues of um, giving people greater, um, greater impacts with, on their health. The tree map of Los Angeles, the areas of lowest tree canopy cover are the areas of the highest incidences of skin cancer, asthma, morbid obesity, and diabetes. They map exactly. Um, and so, yes, it's a socioeconomic link, but the lack of tree cover adds a stress. And so here's additional news coming from Australia why we really want to prioritize trees that give us dense shade. So not only did the climate scientists say that we would experience drought, but they've been talking about hotter hots, also wetter wets, drier dries, um, meaning more fires and all of that. But Los Angeles is expected to get more severe heat days. In Australia, it has hit. Since 2009, uh, people have been dying in Australian cities when it gets really hot. Two weeks ago, for those of you who watched the Australian Open, saw it was 110 degrees on the courts. They're regularly hitting 117 now in some cities. And when it gets that hot, they've discovered, they've just, why they went into deep research very fast of mapping where people were dying and what was happening. And here's what they've discovered. That after three days of heat and the city not cooling down, it's called the urban heat island effect because of all that concrete. When the city doesn't cool down, it puts the human body in stress. And after three nights of not cooling off is when people uh, 
they've seen emergency room visits spike and uh, the mortality spike. And they found that people's best chance of survival is living in a neighborhood with dense tree canopy. So as we move forward in LA, we're going to want to create a much denser tree canopy to create that shade as part of our protection. Because during a heat wave, what happens? That's when we lose our electricity and our ability to rely on technology to cool us down. We're going to need the trees and soil moisture to do it. By the way, in a, in a few weeks, we're bringing the leading climate scientist from Australia to Los Angeles to talk about his research in this exact thing. It will be, stay tuned, March 24th uh, or 25th, we'll be having a seminar in LA. So uh, on to another question. Um, I see so many trees topped. Does the way trees are trimmed affect the amount of water captured? Um, I think I just answered that from not the water capture, but the need to to not top trees, but to have dense canopy for our health protection. Um, I believe, I'm taking a little bit of risk here. First of all, when you top a tree, that's really um, pretty much weakening it and often kill, killing the tree. You can never regrow that canopy that's taken 30, 40 years to grow. Also, when you top it and it doesn't die and it just um, sprouts out really fast, you create a hazard because branches aren't well attached. They tend to break off and fall off a few years later. But it, the tree goes into stress and it starts using even more water to rebuild its canopy. It's not a good thing to do. Tree topping should be illegal. Uh, next question is, isn't it perilous to use gray water that has clothes washing detergent in it to water plants? I've looked into eco-friendly washing agents, but they really don't have the washing machine power of other products. That's a great question. Um, first of all, you should be using the eco-friendly soaps, and there's uh, quite a few of them now. Uh, you can go to almost any health food store and, um, and get a variety of them. I, occasionally, even Costco holds, has them. But I showed you a picture of that three-way valve um, that the city requires. The only thing you're required to do in hooking up your washing machine to your gray water is to put in that three-way valve. It's a very simple lever. And if you're going to use bleaches and other stuff when you want that <clears throat> deep cleaning, that Tide XK clean, you just flip the switch and um, send that water out to the sewage treatment plant instead of to your garden. So I think that's it on questions. And, um, <clears throat> Boy, we've, we've gone over, so uh, I promised 30 minutes, it's been 40. So I wanna thank you so much for your time, for being with us this morning, uh, for your support. Stay tuned for updates um, via the Tree People website, but you're on our mailing list because you signed up for this. So we will be sending you um, this uh, a link so you can have this presentation to share with friends and we will keep you posted. Thanks again. Stay tuned. Take care. We're looking forward to seeing you uh, in our workshops and as a volunteer.